This big male is the 26th of the 145 giraffes who live here in Kure in southern Niger. Number 26 is a white giraffe. The white giraffe is the last to live in its natural habitat and in contact with human beings in Western Africa, outside of areas protected by national parks. For scientists, he's number 26, but the villagers call him Long Neck because of his interminable neck. He's almost 20 feet tall. With his head and legs that are almost white, and the wide reticulated pattern framing the fawn spots of his coat. The white giraffe of Niger is the lightest colored of all giraffes. At the beginning of the 20th century, the giraffe was a very common animal in Western Africa. But from 1970, successive droughts killed more than half the livestock. The price of meat increased, and this led to giraffe poaching. In times of famine, a giraffe is seen above all as a ton of meat on legs. At the beginning of the 1990s, there remained fewer than 50 in only one country, Niger. Spending your days with your head in acacia trees is a giraffe's recipe for happiness. But every day, having to eat 30 kilos of small leaves protected by long thorns is endless work. Its large, thick blue tongue enables it to choose the most tender leaves without pricking itself. However, it's easier when the branches don't have thorns, like those of the Combretum. Contrary to appearances, the giraffes of the Niger don't live in a desert, but in a territory completely settled by man. They share their pastures with domestic ruminants, such as dromedaries. Fortunately for Longneck, the dromedary doesn't eat at the same level as he does. With a height of six meters, the giraffe remains unrivaled, which has often saved its life in times of famine. Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world, and it's one where population growth is highest. To feed themselves, peasants clear the savanna. The expansion of fields and livestock farming encroaches each year on the giraffe's natural habitat. In such conditions, there is reason to be concerned for future generations. When he was born, this baby giraffe was hardly six feet tall. During its first two years, it grew three inches a month. But to reach the 15 feet of his mother, he will have to eat many more leaves, if there are any left. This morning, Longneck and his females witnessed the destruction of their larder. Fatih, Fatima and Zara need money to feed their family. During the dry season, the men go off to work in neighboring countries and the women have to manage alone. They come into the bush in search of firewood. In principle, in the areas where the giraffes live, it's forbidden to cut acacias. But there aren't enough wardens to enforce the law and in southern Niger, wood is the only fuel for cooking. It's impossible to go without it. But with each acacia cut down, a little more of the giraffe's future disappears. To fetch this wood, the women have walked several kilometers from their village. It will be sold to merchants set up on the side of the road leading into Niami, the capital. For each bundle, they will get 24 African francs, about three euro cents. As soon as it's delivered, the wood goes to Niami. And this is why the acacia copses the giraffes feed on are disappearing everywhere. There are a few areas being reforested, like this one. But they've been planted only recently. And it takes much more time for an acacia to grow than it does to cut it down. In the meantime, the giraffes need to eat every day.
For long necks family, the end of the dry season is difficult. The heat gets more and more intense. The dehydrated acacia leaves aren't nourishing enough. Water is scarce. When food is scarce, the harem of long neck, the dominant male, is reduced to only two females and their young. At the beginning of the month of May, the group has settled in the last area where water is still to be found, the valley of the Dalal Bosso, a fossil tributary of the Niger. It has been a long time since the water of the Dalol reached the big river. But here, in the middle of the drought, when everything is parched yellow, the last water holes still sparkle among the lush green vegetation of the Dalol Valley. The Dalol Bosso Valley is a welcome oasis. It's where the villagers breed their cows, sheep and goats in the shade of the old trees. For the giraffes, there is a problem, though. The cows hog the ponds to themselves all day long. And the savannah giants are fearful beasts. To avoid conflict, they wait for the herds to leave before going to drink. In fact, the shepherds chase the giraffes away when they see them approach the water. They reserve the precious liquid for their herds. As soon as you leave the heart of the Dalol Valley, the water table sinks lower. Water becomes inaccessible to the giraffes as well as to humans. To water their livestock, the villagers have had to dig wells. The length of the rope pulled by the donkey indicates the depth at which the water is, 150 to 180 feet. The pulley was given by the Association for the Preservation of Niger Giraffes. In exchange for peace for its protégés, it supports the local economy. In Niger, 85% of the population lives off farming. By helping the peasants to live better, the association has eradicated giraffe poaching. It also fights against the felling of acacia trees. The giraffes never come to drink from the wells. They have to find water on their own. It's the end of the day. Once again, the temperature almost reached 45 degrees centigrade. During heat waves, you have to queue up to get close to water. Blackbirds and doves hurry to drink before the cows arrive. In such extreme climatic conditions, a giraffe cannot survive for more than two or three days without drinking. To reach the nearest watering hole, this female won't hesitate to cross this dirt track. Thirst makes her forget her fear of man. It's true that she no longer risks her life when approaching humans, since poaching has stopped. But boldness has its limits. She's waiting for the cows and, above all, the shepherds to leave before approaching the water. During the entire dry season, giraffes can never drink before nightfall. It's 11 p.m. The cows have bedded down. Everything's quiet. But she can't even take a drink on the sly. A spying filmmaker has set up some lights. Neither heat nor dust can prevent it. The species must be perpetuated. The giraffe's mating season lasts the whole 12 months of the year. These two young males are fighting for the big black eyes of a young female. Only the winner will have the right to court her. Given the beauty of the prize, the fight is merciless. The opponents stand sideways. It's the fighting position blows with their necks, their shoulders and their heads. No blows are forbidden. The tips of the horns are blunted, but they can still inflict wounds. Worse, the opponents could break their necks. Only seven vertebrae for such a long neck. That's their weak point. A single vertebra out of place, and that's how one dies for love among giraffes.
the winner goes right up to his prize, a ravishing female. Her graceful neck, glossy fawn coat, and silky long eyelashes make her a beauty queen of the savannah. However, it's the sweet scent of her urine that motivates the male. She releases a few drops, just to signal she's receptive. He curls his lip. It's the Fleming test. They seem to be on the same wavelength, but in the end, it's always she who decides. The Harmattan, the dry burning wind from the Sahara, descends upon the Dalol Valley with a thick layer of dust. The air is unbreathable, but never mind. This morning, Long Neck, the dominant male, is feeling affectionate, loving even. One of the two females of his harem is on heat, as every fortnight, until she's impregnated. She's playing up a little, but Long Neck knows he needs to insist. He'll follow her closely the whole day long, repeatedly cuddling up to her until she changes her mind. If she wants. Perhaps. He caresses her. She ruminates. A long love duo starts beneath the acacias. Among the giraffes, when you're in love, the females lead you on, far and for a long time. A mirage in the dry season, this stretch of dusty bushland is in fact a millet field after harvest. At the end of the month of May, since there's nothing left to eat or to trample on, the giraffes wander through here without bothering anyone. Not for long, though. Today, the children of the village of Canaray have come to clear the field. There's no time left to lose. In a few weeks, with the first rains, the men who went far away during the dry season will return to plant the millet. The field must be ready for planting. The men will stay with their families in the village until the millet harvest at the end of October, before setting out again. When the millet season comes around, the giraffes are not welcome in the Dalol Boso Valley. The domestic livestock is also asked to pasture elsewhere. The Fulani shepherds leave to take their goats, cows and sheep to pasture in areas of the savannah that aren't cultivated several tens of kilometres from here. The migration is done in several stages. The young Fulani shepherds set up camps next to their herds. They will remain there several days, the time it takes to graze all the grass before going on to the next place. <laughs> the 
the giraffes follow the same movement as the herds. At the end of May, Longneck, the dominant male, gives the signal to depart. His objective, to keep his feet dry. When it rains, the level of the water table rises. The ground of the Dalal Boso Valley becomes soggy, and giraffes hate walking in mud. There's only one solution, to go up onto the Kure Plateau. The ground there remains dry even in heavy rain, and it's only a short walk away, 50 kilometers. From acacia to acacia, the dominant male and his harem cross the area where the granaries hold the remains of the last harvest. In this one, a prudent peasant has saved a big pile of rather tempting goodies. On the left, peanuts. On the right, dried beans. All of which are full of protein. A real feast. But the peasant has used barbed wire to make his granary giraffe-proof. It's impossible to get a single mouthful. If the giraffes continued their way 100 kilometers to the south, they would reach W National Park, where they would find water, acacias, and peace and quiet all year long. The park is called W because of the meandering shape of the Niger River that crosses it. Many animals live there peacefully. Buffalo, Defasso waterbuck, Oraby, But W is also the territory of the giraffe's worst predator, the lion. He looks out for his prey from a large rock overlooking the river. This is what he's found is the least tiring. The first antelope to take a drink will be in trouble. The vegetation is dense in W, too dense for the giraffe. Its large size condemns it to living in a more open space. And the giraffe is wary of lions capable of pouncing on it when it stoops down to drink. The river has other teeth, those of the Nile crocodile. If there's no antelope or giraffe, the lion, who is a lazy hunter, will be content with a guinea fowl for dinner. So the giraffes won't go into W. Their road stops in the tiger bush. This is a degraded savanna where vegetation and laterite alternate in parallel strips in a pattern resembling the coat of the tiger. At the end of the month of May, Heavy rain falls on southern Niger. In a few weeks, the landscape is transformed. There's water everywhere. Everything becomes green again. The rainy season is springtime in the savanna. For the giraffes, life has changed. They no longer have to hide at night to drink. The group of long neck, the dominant male, has grown. It now includes 17 individuals, five females, their young, plus a few adolescents. It's a very large family. The females can be recognized by their coats that are lighter than those of the males, and they are smaller. Only 15 feet tall, compared with 20 feet for adult males. The size of the groups increases with the quantity of food available. What's more, giraffes love being in a group, and the larger the group, the more opportunities they have of showing their affection to one another. During the rainy season, the acacias of the tiger bush become covered with tender young shoots. The giraffes make the most of them. Ruminating together is a way of feeling in harmony with the rest of the family.
At the end of September, the Dalaloboso Valley is covered in a mosaic of green. After the last rainfall, the ground in the valley is drying up. The giraffes will be able to walk there again without getting their feet wet. As every year, in the beginning of the month of October, Longneck leaves the tiger bush to return with his family into the valley. Disaster. The deserted area where the giraffes moved freely during the dry season is now a huge millet field. No matter, it takes more to deter a giraffe. Long Neck and his group have a single objective, to find their acacias, and on the outskirts of the fields, the occasional wild melon with its flesh full of water. Of course, to get to the acacias, they've had to trample the peanut fields a little, and the peasant woman who planted them is furious. In fact, the acacias which grow between the fields are the remnants of the original savanna, the ancestral territory of the giraffes. Giraffes and humans are competing to use the same lands. As she picks her peanuts, the peasant woman keeps an eye on Longneck and his little group. She'd like to chase them out of her field, but she's afraid. The giraffes may be peaceful, but the male weighs over 1,200 kilos, and each of his females 800 kilos the peasant woman feels rather small. The peanut fields are hemmed in by the millet fields. The giraffes don't eat the millet, but as they walk through the fields, they break the stems and make the grains fall. The owners would like to put fences around their fields, but the price of barbed wire is beyond their means, so they can't prevent the giraffes from entering them. In fact, in the millet fields, what the giraffes are looking for are their favorite dessert. Beans, fresh and full of protein, delicious. Grazing in a field like this, neck down, is very unusual behavior for giraffes. This shows that they really feel safe here in southern Niger. They no longer fear humans at all. Fatih and Balkissa, two women from the village of Tolo, have come to pick the beans they planted in the family field. The giraffes have completely destroyed our field. The women aren't pleased. These giraffes are taking the beans from their children's mouths. Of course, the new millet harvest will soon be here, but it will hardly be enough to provide food for two months. It is to complete it that the women plant beans. For them, they're vital. Fatih complains to her husband, Ibrahim Abdullah, the village school teacher. Look, the giraffes have destroyed everything. You didn't find any beans to pick? That's all you found? This is what we found. What's the matter with these giraffes? I'm going to talk to the association, otherwise if ever they come back into my field, I'll cut off one of their legs. But they're important for us. They leave nothing for us in the fields. Even the ordinary beans we eat, there are no beans. I want to talk to the association. The association to which Ibrahim intends to complain is the Association for the Preservation of Niger Giraffes. The people in charge are Pierre Gay from France and Omer Dovi from Niger. The association won't reimburse Ibrahim for the price of his beans. It doesn't directly compensate the victims of damage caused by the giraffes, but it distributes microloans, funding of several tens of euros which allow the villagers to develop economic activities. Indirectly, this compensates for the damage. Pierre is the owner of the Douai-la-Fontaine Zoo in France. 
The zoo supports nature conservation programs all over the world. And that's how, in 2001, the Douai Zoo completely funded the association managed in Niger by OMA. Thanks to this association, the number of giraffes has tripled in a few years. There are constantly new projects to support. This morning, under the palava tree in Diribangu, the subject is the funding of new wells. Omar points out that the credit afforded by the Association for the Preservation of Giraffes is repayable. Bad payers are barred from the list, but this is not the case here. This well will avoid the women having to walk several kilometers in the sun with 20 kilo buckets of water on their heads. They will be able to focus on more profitable activities. It's noon. Long Neck and his family spend the hottest hour of the day ruminating. The acacia provides shade and meals. It truly is the giraffe's best friend. For now, all is well. Long Neck has successfully returned to the valley of Dalol Boso. The trees in the area bear enough young shoots, the ones the giraffe eats first. After its passage, the tree will regenerate by growing new buds. That's how the giraffe maintains its natural habitat. Around here, there are really too many stinging insects. They have proliferated during the rainy season. Other animals, such as the elephant or the buffalo, are used to taking mud baths to rid themselves of them, but not the giraffe. Fortunately, specialized workers come to the rescue. Ox peckers, birds that live attached to their coats who feed almost exclusively on their parasites. But in spite of appearances, the ox peckers belong to an endangered species. Insecticides are contaminating their food chain and reducing their fecundity. A herd is approaching, another reason for changing acacia. An incredible quantity of flies and different insects harry the cows. Even an army of famished ox peckers couldn't eliminate them. In addition, these herds, badly cared for, carry parasites and diseases, dangerous for giraffes. When the cows arrive, Long Neck and his family immediately move away. As long as the giraffes are around, Fatty won't have any beans to eat. As compensation, the Association for the Preservation of Niger Giraffes has given her a microloan of 25,000 African francs, approximately 38 euros. With this money, 
Fatty has bought a big sack of wheat flour, oil, yeast, salt and sugar, and she started selling fritters. She sells them for 25 African francs each, roughly four euro cents. Some customers find them expensive, but since they're delicious, Fatty's business is doing well. The dough has to rise several hours in the sun. Meanwhile, the young woman pounds peanuts and pimento to make the seasoning for the fritters. She then carefully tidies and cleans her house. Fritter lovers come to buy them at her home and everything needs to be tidy to receive them. Thanks to these fritters, Fatty's family lives better. In exchange, she lets the giraffes eat the beans in her field. The previous year, the association funded several projects in Tolo, the village where Fatty lives. The most spectacular is the well with the pedal mechanism. Omer and Pierre, the two men in charge, come to check that the money has been properly used. The problem was that the pedal mechanism of the well often broke down. The hardest thing was to find a competent repairman. But everything's fine now. It's working. Each family that comes to fetch water at the end of the month pays 100 francs. It's with this money that the small repairs are made. So everyone benefits from it and it works now. Omer and Pierre finished their inspection at Fatty's. She's the one who's invested the association's money in the tastiest way. Have you made a profit or are you just doing it like that? With my profits, I've already bought a sheep. So now you're ready to repay the association so the other women can get a loan? Yes. Can we taste the fritters? Oh, yes, you can taste one. What's that then? It's the tutu, spices. Mmm, for breakfast, it's going to be good. Right, Fatty, I'm going to taste. <laughs> Pierre and Omer's visits never go unnoticed. The griots, the village musicians, have composed the dance of the giraffe in their honor. The whole village knows it by heart. The steps of the dance imitate the movements of the giraffes. It's the beginning of October. The insects born with the rain sting even harder at night. Longneck no longer knows how to get rid of them. Fortunately, in nature, there's always a convenient scraper adapted to each type of problem.
It's the end of the day. The acacia bundles are taken to the village. It'll soon be time to prepare the evening meal. In southern Niger, few villages are supplied with electricity. People live with the sun. And all year round, the sun sets at around 6 p.m. Fatty's neighbour is fortunate. The giraffes have left her enough beans to feed her family. Nightfall doesn't cut the giraffe's appetite, but there's a problem. In Long Neck's area, the acacias are becoming scarce. There only remain a few old, very tough leaves that aren't at all tasty. In this area, the number of acacias has declined due to wood cutting. It'll soon be time to move on. Sunday morning. It's market day in the village of Kodo. Everyone uses the same dirt track. A few humans aren't enough to bother a large group of giraffes, but 17 giants at the same time is impressive for mere human beings. Longneck and his family are also off to market. In the end, it was the acacias they were grazing on that chased them away. In fact, acacias have a secret weapon against giraffes. Above a certain limit of consumption, they secrete a tannin-based toxin, which keeps predators, in other words, giraffes, at bay. At the end of the dirt track, the tarmac. That's how the road to Niami is called. The villagers from the surrounding area come every Sunday to the market in Kodo to buy and sell vegetables, poultry, craftwork, and even acacia wood. The giraffes won't be eating any leaves from them either. The acacia branches will be used, among other things, for cooking kebabs. At the market in Kodo, natron can also be found. It's a mineral salt extracted from the ground. It contains bicarbonate of soda. The shepherds give it to their livestock to help them digest. The giraffes search it out by themselves, mixed in with the soil. Longneck doesn't regret having moved. This place offers everything a family of giraffes needs to be happy. Mineral salts and fresh acacias covered with tender leaves. But the dominant male has already found a new cause for concern. Among the young, competition is hotting up. These two youngsters are only just two and a half and are already fighting to know who is the strongest. They place themselves top to tail. In this position, they don't run the risk of breaking their necks like adults. This is just a friendly joust, but they can seriously wound each other. Calm down, you two. You'll hurt yourselves. Longneck has placed himself between the opponents to separate them. The fight stops immediately. The two youngsters are sheepish. In principle, the hierarchy is often ill-defined within groups of giraffes. But physical strength sometimes seems to be the most persuasive, as in this case. Longneck intervenes. 
They stop fighting. No discussion is allowed. Peace has been made until the next fight. Hardly is this problem resolved than Long Neck, the dominant male, faces another conflict. His power of seduction is challenged. A young adult male dares to court the prettiest female in his harem. The female is no doubt unavailable. She moves away, kindly flaring her young lover. In giraffe language, this means you're nice, but maybe another time. The young male isn't put off. He insists, I'll follow you until the next acacia. But the dominant male refuses to allow his prettiest female to be stolen without reacting. He pounces on the couple and chases his rival without further consideration. This virile attitude has rather impressed the female. Reconciliation rapidly ensues. You are the strongest and the most handsome. It's you I love, she explains by affectionately rubbing up to him. The fight is over. To seal their friendship, the two young males pretend to mate. It's a very common game among adolescents, a form of apprenticeship to social relations. Longneck has mated for real. The belly of this big female has swollen. The delivery will be soon. She will give birth to a single offspring after 15 months of gestation. In the course of her life, which will last 25 or 30 years, she will have no more than eight viable baby giraffes. October. The rainy season is far behind. It only lasts from May to the end of September. The millet is ripe. The dromedary has been authorized to graze in the millet field. Normally, it only eats the leaves without touching the ears. The ears of millet are harvested by the humans. They will enable them to feed the village for two months. For the association, it's time, as every year, to count its protégés. The photos taken in previous years make it possible to recognize each giraffe from one year to the next. Jean-Patrick Soureau, the researcher employed for the counting, has coloured on the photos the clearly identifiable markings he has spotted on the coats of each of them. Thanks to the photos from last year, Kimba Ide, the guide, immediately recognised female number 210. She's identifiable thanks to the marking at the base of her neck. It's the one that's coloured in the album. The giraffe population has increased again. Captain Zumari Salifu, in charge of the giraffe unit at the Ministry of the Environment, is satisfied. That's a young giraffe of this year. The protection measures are effective. Saumur in France, on the banks of the River Loire. The zoo at Douai-la-Fontaine, of which Pierre Gay is the manager, is only a few kilometers away. Thanks to him, the Pays de la Loire have become a high spot for the preservation of West African giraffes. Back from Niger, 
Pierre is greeted by the Siamangs, monkeys from the tropical forest of Malaysia and Sumatra. First, come on, come here. The animals at the Douai Zoo weren't captured in the wild. They were born on site or arrived here thanks to exchanges with other zoos decided on by the European breeding plans. These plans make it possible to avoid problems due to interbreeding. The zoos contribute to preserving biodiversity. Pierre has witnessed the birth of most of the animals in his zoo. With Kata, the black rhinoceros, the feeling of friendship is mutual. The giraffes of the Douai La Fontaine Zoo don't come from Niger. They are descendants of the giraffes of the Vincennes Zoo in Paris, imported from different Western African countries since the 1930s. This morning, Pierre Gay is expecting news from Omer Dovi. Hello. Hello, Omer? Yes, Pierre. Hello, how are you? Recently, Giraffe Territory has benefited from a mobile phone network. What's the result of the count? We have 21 births and three giraffes that were never photographed in 2005 and 2006. At the end of the count, we have 165 giraffes. That makes 22 more. Yes, that's a good result. You've worked well. That's great. With this increase in the number of giraffes, we're counting on you to be able to increase the number of loans. I have to find the money, obviously. I know I can always count on you to provide at least 10 microloans for the women. They're always glad of them. We've got plenty of contacts. I think we'll be able to help you. Well, that's great. Fine. Speak to you soon, Omer. Bye. Goodbye, Pierre. The end of October in the valley of Dalolboso. It's the giraffe's favorite season. The acacia leaves are still tender. The beans are growing in the middle of the millet fields. Many young giraffes frolic about under the protection of their mothers. And there will soon be other births. During the last count, the association spotted 40 females in gestation. The last giraffe of Western Africa is doing better and better. The counts are proof of this. The population has tripled in 15 years. It's a perfect example of a successful nature preservation action. Associating economic development and the protection of the giraffe has made a balance possible. The villagers are proud of their giraffes. They belong to their national heritage. Yet, the white giraffe isn't completely out of danger. Ensuring the cohabitation of giraffes and a growing human population is a difficult challenge. The felling of acacias, the expansion of farming and repeated droughts that heighten competition around watering holes remain serious threats. When it comes to protection of the environment, the battle is never completely won. But as long as there are acacias, Long Neck, his family, and the other 148 giraffes will be able to live happily in the savannah of Niger.